want to make a few more comments concerning the ATP reaction cycle, and then I'll finish off. So it's ATP binding at Groyel and not hydrolysis that triggers productive folding. So this was a, an experiment carried out by Hayes Rye with what we believe is sort of the minimalist version of Groyel that's folding active. So a single ring version of Groyel that's mutant in such a way that it can bind ATP and thus bind Groyel. I haven't really uh, directly mentioned, but I hope that some of those EM images support that you have to have ATP binding first to move the apical so the GROES can bind. Uh, and here he's recruited GROES to a Rubisco bound ring. And what he observes is that he can produce the native uh, state of Rubisco efficiently in this capacity without any ATP hydrolysis. Uh, moreover, Charu Chaudhry, who's also here at this meeting, showed that the gamma phosphate is absolutely crucial to this action. Uh, with ADP, you can produce a dome chamber. So you can bind polypeptide to SR1, for example, and then add um, ADP and grow ES, and you get an encapsulated polypeptide. But it's stuck on the cavity walls, and it never reaches the native state. But simulating the addition of uh, the gamma phosphate, either by adding aluminum fluoride or beryllium fluoride, what Charu observed was suddenly you restore the normal kinetics of refolding. And so what we believe has happened is that you've supplied, and she's shown crystallographically that you're making seven or eight new hydrogen bonds that are providing energetics that basically jerk the apical domains in some way that the polypeptide is now really ejected into the folding chamber and it now proceeds to the native state. So um, there's a power stroke, we believe, here that's involved. Uh, of movement of this machine that's necessary uh, in a concerted way to eject the non-native polypeptide off the binding sites uh, into the chamber where it can fold to the native state. So here's the overall look at the reaction cycle, and I'm going to show you this in a movie in just a second. But the idea is that uh, a polypeptide can bound to a non-ATP occupied ring, but recent experiments that Navneen has carried out show that uh, ATP always wins the race to an open ring. So uh, ATP, it, it's binding tenfold faster than non-native polypeptide. So polypeptide is normally coming on to an ATP bound ring. Um, maybe there's an advantage there that the apical domains are starting to move. They're more flexible. They're breaking apart from each other. Uh, and so it's easier to see non-native structure. Uh, but then, of course, you reach this RS open state that we've just described which recruits GROES, and now this gigantic conformational change occurs that produces the domed folding chamber. So this is the longest lived state of the reaction cycle uh, with a T half of about eight or nine seconds or so. At the end of that time, hydrolysis occurs in the cis ring, and I haven't mentioned this, but there's anti-cooperativity between the GROES rings, such that when there's ATP bound to one ring, there's nothing on the other ring. So once hydrolysis occurs here in the cis ring, it gates entry of ligands into the opposite ring. So ATP will bind and non-native polypeptide will bind. But ATP is really the key operative in ejecting the ligands from the cis ring. It sends an allosteric signal, the nature of which we still don't completely understand, that ejects grow yes, ejects non-native polypeptide or native polypeptide if it's made it to the native state in the eight or 10 seconds and ultimately ADP as well. Uh, and so uh, native polypeptides obviously won't come back to the machine, but non-native or uncommitted states can really compete for any of the chaperones, for example, in the bacterial cytosol. Um, uh, it's a kinetic partitioning, we believe, but they certainly could come back to grow EL and have another try. But meanwhile, on the other ring, binding of ATP and non-native polypeptide basically sets up a new cis folding chamber, and now this ring becomes folding active. So with a single round of ATP, you at once eject the old folding active ring and nucleate a new folding active ring. And so now I want to just show you this film that basically connects the dots of all the crystal structures and all the EM structures we have to date, uh, and just gives you a general idea of how the machine uh, operates. So now you're looking uh, at a single subunit here for its three domains. Then you're going to look down the barrel of the machine, but remember it's blocked off at the equatorial levels. But all this yellow at the, at the terminal end is the hydrophobic polypeptide binding surface. Uh, and now you're going to see that ATP 
uh, comes into the equatorial domains of one ring, starts to elevate and counterclockwise twist those apical domains, and during that time, polypeptide binds uh, in the open ring. So that's a computationally pulled apart DHFR. Now you get to RS open, GROES docks through its own hydrophobic surfaces. You get this huge uh, elevation and uh, uh, rotational movement, and now polypeptide chain folding occurs in a, what we believe is a passive chamber. And at the end of 10 seconds, hydrolysis occurs. The free phosphates come out, gate entry of ATP into the opposite ring. Its arrival starts to discharge this ring, but at the same time sets this ring up as being folding active. So here come the ligands out of the cis ring, folded polypeptide, ADP is last to leave, and this ring now becomes folding active. So I just want to show you this in a more real-time situation so that you can see that the machine really spends most of its time in a folding active state and transits one ring to the other uh, on the time scale of really only about a second. It's a really very quick transition. So this will show you now folding in the top ring. And then you're going to basically see all hell break loose and, and suddenly the trans ring will become, become the folding active ring. And so on the time scale of about a second, all the conformational changes occur. And now this ring becomes folding active. So I want to stop there. Um, and acknowledge that a huge number of people have contributed to this work over all these years. So within my own group, there are roughly 30 people who have contributed, and I don't have time to really name everybody. I've tried to mention uh, some of the main uh, advances by uh, a number of these people. But I've also been lucky with my Yale colleagues, nearly 10 of which have been willing to collaborate with me over the years and help this project forward. Outside Yale, uh, nearly 35 different people have collaborated with us over the years and been wonderful to work with. That's been part of the really just major joy of, of working on this machine is collectivizing with people and, and getting new ideas about how things might work. Uh, and finally, there's my own gang at home that put up with all of this. Uh, my son Mike, my daughter Annie, Mikey's wife and little Dave, and my wife Martina. This is us in Yellowstone Park. Uh, several years ago. It's hard to get everybody together at this point. Um, but we've really had a lot of fun at home, even while all of this has been going on. So I thank you again very much for the opportunity to present this work. Uh, and thanks once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes this evening's events. I remind you that there is a party and reception in the uh, Hilton Hotel Key Ballroom, and I hope to see you all there in a few minutes. <laughs>